to everyone for joining us for this um, second session in our 2023-24 Back to School series. Uh, if we have not met before, uh, my name is Sarah Ye. I am the Associate Head for Teaching, Learning, and Faculty. And uh, this is my 16th year at the school. Um, also a history teacher, in addition to the administrative stuff, and the current parent of a 12th grader and a 9th grader. So lots of busy things in the CA world. Uh, and I'm really excited tonight uh, that we get to shine a spotlight on a part of our curriculum and faculty professional development that I think is pretty cool. It's something we call Department X. And this is an initiative that came about through the generosity of the Faculty Leadership Endowed Fund, uh, which was created to provide CA teachers and staff with resources to develop new curricula, exchange ideas across disciplines or departments, uh, and to really create and seize opportunities for experiential learning. And the, the whole idea of Department X really grew out of conversations that were happening. Might be reduced. Between yeah. um, administrators and department heads around how could we create more opportunities to help people break out of departmental boundaries? How could we create time and space to think deeply about curriculum? And how do we make that work within our existing schedule, our commitments, and our pay structure, and all of those logistical details? And out of that, we developed Department X. And uh, it's always funny to me, Department X was intended to be a temporary shorthand name. It was something that we tossed around to talk about it while we were figuring out what it would look like. And we always thought, it would go away and we would end up with some kind of fancy title for it. Um, but Department X stuck. And I, I think it's because it captured exactly what we were trying to do, which is really, how do we how do we solve this question of how can we have courses that don't neatly fit into a particular department? Let's not try to wedge them in somewhere um, or a project that someone's exploring. Let's actually nurture these as their own thing. So we introduced Department X I think it's seven years ago now, and it is an opportunity for teachers to pursue partnerships and interdisciplinary endeavors within a semester's work. So the funding allows for what we call a one-eighth FTE, basically a course release time from a faculty member's um, current appointment to plan for a Department X course offering, reimagine curriculum, maybe co-teach a course in some cases. It is application-based and you can apply as an individual or a team. And then projects are selected each year through a committee that includes various administrators, department heads, and previous Department X members. To give you some examples of past projects, those have included um, a collaboration between English and history faculty around a course on truth. We had a project on math, data, and racial justice in urban planning. We had a fusion of kind of literature, oh, technology, and computer science into a digital stories class that is actually going to run again in an updated iteration next year. So those of you with current students can look out for that. Um, we've had someone design a course on modern physics. We've had a collaboration of science and English faculty on literature and climate science and um, an exploration by modern and classical languages and English faculty on how storytelling might be featured and woven into the ninth grade curriculum. And as you're going to see tonight, I mean, for students, obviously, they've gotten some amazing courses out of Department X, but I think what's important is that the heart of Department X is really the professional development that comes from doing this work. Uh, I think multiple participants have talked um, with me about the work they've done with colleagues uh, through Department X. They've described it as one of the best professional development experiences of their career, which I think is just a, a, a real testament to the incredible folks teaching here and how much they love teaching in community and in collaboration. And I think everyone who's been part of it probably would talk about pieces that they took from their Department X work that carried over into future courses or pedagogical pedagogical approaches that they employed. So it's when we think about what, what Department X touches, it's not just 
the students who are in that particular course, it's really helping shape future initiatives. Um, you know, and I, the very first Department X course, for example, which was between Justin, who's here tonight <laughs> in film, and Kim Frederick in history, helped launch a, a whole bunch of threads in our courses around how we think about public history, partnering with um, local institutions, and how we capture and tell stories through media. Some projects, including one you'll hear about tonight, are not necessarily course specific, but they're really designed to help us as faculty think about and tackle new things on the horizon in education. And our current writing center, which supports a vibrant peer tutoring program in writing, grew out of a Department X project. And that's you know just another example of something that has really stuck and had lasting impact. Um, so with that kind of background and, and context, this year we are fortunate to have two Department X projects running, and I really want you to be able to hear more about that work. So I think I am now gonna turn things over to them and that Justin is up first. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming and hearing uh, what we're up to over here at CA. Um, as Sarah uh, mentioned, um, this is my second time at the rodeo of Department X work. Um, I absolutely adore this opportunity um, and I'm very grateful for the school um, for providing the resources, um, namely um, that of uh, compensated time to think deliberately um, and carefully about, about ideas, be they curricular design or um, what my colleague Andrew Stevens and I engaged in this year um, around the notion of artificial intelligence um, and what that landscape currently looks like, could look like, the implications for students at our school, how we prepare them for the world beyond, um, specifically th um, through a creative lens um, for our, our work. But I'll talk about how that's already expanding um, and evolving rapidly, like the landscape of artificial intelligence um, itself. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we had some frameworks. So I think I'll just talk through like how I approached this work and how I paired up with Andrew, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, he's lucky enough to be playing with a very newborn infant at home instead. Uh, so um, priorities. Um, but um, I, as Sarah said, I, I had done a Department X before, a very rewarding one uh, with Kim, Kim Frederick in history, where we had worked with the Robbins House, a, a local um Community Museum uh, centered on the Black history of Concord and um, uh, thought about how we could um, support the museum through um, intentional production of media um, in some sort of forward thinking media presentation like augmented reality and virtual reality. So the students uh, dove deep into that local history and then um, their capstone project was to work in collaboration with one another and uh, find ways to um, deliver this information to both local and remote crowds. Um, and that was great. Um, I loved the opportunity to um, actually dig deep into a course with a colleague uh, where we had carved out time both for preparation leading up to, but also the luxury to team teach in a single block, which as you can imagine is a costly endeavor for the school and a great opportunity for students. And you'll hear more about that, I think in a little bit when I stop yammering. Uh, but um, this particular um, uh, exploration that Andrew actually came to me initially to propose, we had already been playing with, uh, to give you a little background, I teach film in the visual arts department. This has been 17 years now. Um, Andrew uh, teaches in the English department. Um, and we both um, have uh, had a long standing conversation about um, creativity, the arts. He's a big film buff. Uh, we're both writers when we're not teaching. So we talk about creative writing as well. So as all of this early AI, generative AI specifically, um, uh, platforms as they were rising um, and becoming available for public use, we quickly, like most everyone else who's curious about this stuff, latched on and started just volleying back and forth um, a lot of material to just see where we could push um, the uh, technology um, and where we could poke holes at it. And that eventually, um, folded over with what was naturally a conversation that not only we at Concord Academy, but just about every educational institution around late last spring was um, discussing, which is how rapidly the just this um, set of tools came at us like a tidal wave and the potential implications of what that means for 
students, I think whether or not you're a technology geek or not, um, it was hard to look at a newspaper, open up your Facebook feeds and uh, not be drowning in headlines about AI and the doom and the euphoria that AI would bring us all. Um, so we thought we should um, maybe put um, all our spare time fun into a proposal um, and the school was um, generous enough to accept our proposal to um, engage in um, specifically a prompt that if I can remember it vaguely um, was the we wanted to explore the implications of generative AI as it related to creativity and students, um, both the possibilities and the potential drawbacks of that. Um, and we did this in a variety of ways. Um, there's a, a whole slew of platforms that I don't need to bore you with tonight, but just to give you a smattering, um, there's a program called Studio Write um, that um, uh, tries to serve as a writing partner in your style rather than chat GPT, which is more, you can push it with the right kind of prompt to write in your style, but Studio Write from the get-go was, was proposing that. So we played with uh, this technology a little bit uh, Dali and Midjourney, as well as a few other generative a uh, image um, systems. So there's, and I, I don't mean to speak redundantly, but just in case people are just wondering what I'm speaking about, there there's generally two main um, avenues that people are interested in with generative AI specifically. And by generative, I mean it's seemingly creating something out of a prompt, uh, uh, like magic. Um, and uh, one of them is writing based, so that would be Studio Write, Chat GPT, um, and and the like. And then the other is more image. When we began, image based, still image, and that would be Dali Mid Journey. Um, and quickly, as we started um, working on this, there was a wave of whole new technologies coming at us fast. Um, first laughable, and now pretty convincing. So uh, now we have generative video to reckon with um, as we head into an election year, which is a little bit disturbing, to be honest. Um, and then perplexity is probably one of the more interesting other things that has emerged while we've been looking at this, and that is a um, artificially intelligent powered search engine. So it will sort of gather and source in a sort of super powered Google search format. Um, as we were moving through all this, uh, we were also doing um, some um, quality, and I credit Andrew for most of this. He's a very literally minded individual. So he's doing a lot of reading, uh, uh, specifically science fiction takes on this, um, uh, philosophical meanderings on humanity's relationship with technology, not just in this moment, but um, scaling back um, through all time to the pencil. Um, and those were some really rich and interesting conversations that um, helped push how we thought about it. Um, specifically this sort of cycle that you can see as you um, look at all of this through history, which is that with any um, new technology, you generally have these moments of euphoria and terror where you have these conversations about this is going to um, uh, offer us all the tools to somehow rise above the uh, innate flaws that uh, we have as human beings. Um, and then uh, the more doomed that this, this technology is just going to crush us and take away anything that makes us human. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny to look back uh, at when people are talking about the rise of something as simple as a pencil and, and they're having the same kind of responses to the technology. Um, obviously, it's accelerating at a much more rapid rate now. As I said, you know, we, we would be discussing the clunkiness of still image generation with these uh, products uh, one week and the next week we would see stunning rendered video um, that would be hard to separate from real life. So it does, I, I don't wanna dismiss it as same as before. I think there is something particularly 21st century and unique about the rate at which these tools are embedding themselves in our everyday culture. Um, but I think it's good to look back at how we've responded as a civilization prior. Um, what we found ultimately, as we kept going from these high level philosophical conversations to just the, the work of trying to create things with it. We did a variety of things. We would write um, and push it to write things for us, uh, augment things that we wrote. Um, I created, I'm a screenwriter uh, as well as a, a teacher here at Concord Academy. And one of the banes of my existence is uh, when you pitch a screenplay, um, nowadays you can't just do that. You need to pitch it with a visual pitch deck as it's known, like images that sort of support uh, the film that you're trying to propose to 
producers that somehow have forgotten how to imagine, imagine what that looks like with words. Um, so I created a whole pitch deck using mid journey. It was exhausting uh, to pull it off. Um, uh, and it was exciting for a while. And then we hit this interesting wall where it no longer became exciting. It actually became a little dispiriting. And then it just became a little bit soulless. So we went through this cycle of creation. And I finally hit upon this with some great um, language that is is starting to circulate with people that are thinking about this, which is that these tools as wonderful and um, novel as they feel when you first use them. If you have ever engaged in an act of genuine creativity, um, you realize that um, the tools that they are pushing, and I, I want to speak specifically of, of the ones that are on everyone's lips with the headlines, those tools are uh, what uh, are often known as probabilistic tools. Um, and what that means is that they are um, referencing a large data set, um, and then they are just averaging their very best guess of what um, you are looking for based on that data set. Not unlike Google, when you say dog um, care near me, and it'll give you the 10 average dog care places near you. It's much more complicated than that. But um, at the end of the day, it is a probability that it's delivering. Um, and you as a creator have to just own that and say, well, that's kind of what I was looking for, or that's close, but let me try and tweak it a little. And you can do what's called prompt engineering, which is just glorified language to suggest that you're doing something more than tweaking your sentences. Um, to try and push it and make it a little bit different. But ultimately, if you've ever explored visual art, if you've ever um, tried to like craft a short story on your own, you realize it's really going to take more work than it's worth. What you're really uh, gaining in novelty, you're losing in um, the autonomy you have as a creator. Um, so then the other end of that is deterministic creation, which is what we do as artists. We, in our mind, synthesize a wonderful data set, just like these magical machines are. Um, but we actually have the ability and the autonomy to create what we want with that based on our skill set and our craft level uh, that we've trained. And the satisfaction that comes from that, um, I have yet to see a set of tools that can deliver that. Um, I'm getting somewhere with what this means to our students in a second, I promise. Um, but Meredith, cut me off. I, I don't know how far I've been rambling. Um, so... Ultimately, um, the flashy tools, Studio Write, Dolly, Mid Journey, I, I think there's a lesson to be taught to students. Um, and refreshingly, I think most of them have already taught it to themselves, which is that these are interesting um, and there's something not to be ignored because they are a new um, chapter in technology. They're a new chapter in how we think about um, reality, how we uh, consider truth, what we can actually um, claim is real and what we need to dig in a little deeper to verify is real. Um, but ultimately, I, I, um, I would dismiss most of them as gimmicky. I, I think they are, um, I think they're going to flatten out um, shortly. That is not to say AI, AI is not useful as a technology by any means. Uh, I think there's a whole slew of wonderful products that would edge closer to deterministic that are already embedded in a lot of creative tools that people are using. So I teach with DaVinci Resolve. It's an editing program for my film students. Um, and within DaVinci Resolve, if you have a voice recording and there's a bunch of cars behind it, mixed in the same thing, you can use uh, DaVinci uh, Resolve's neural network of AI to separate out the human voice and remove all the noise. And you can, most importantly, access a set of sliders and control how much you want of that and how little you want of that. That, I would say, is where this technology is probably going to be most interesting for creators. Um, I haven't even gone into the ethics of it, and I don't want to talk too much, but um, that is another big um, hesitation I have right now, having come out of thinking about this a lot this year, which is I can't ignore the fact that all of these tools that are pushing one step button click and you have an interesting image to cr create um, have done so by um, stripping uh, what is copyright work from artists who unknowingly uh, were partners in this um, in this process. Um, and they'll talk a big game about like public domain and public usage. But at the end of the day, uh, when you pair um, the origins of how these machines work um, and the headlines that people are now losing their jobs as a result of that, I, I take great pause in um, using this in a celebratory way like I might have when I started this research. Um, 
I think I'm approaching it much more cautionary now, much more um, asking students to really think hard about what these uh, systems are doing, where they're drawing their data from, what the um, long-term effect of that means for the humans behind that data um, that uh, created in the first place, not knowing this was coming down the pike. Um, so I don't want to end on doom and gloom, but but I, I have to say it's, it's a little gray these days for me thinking about AI. Uh, more productive, uh, we have uh, been um, pulled into a much larger conversation. There's uh, currently an AI um, uh, um, subgroup of faculty and staff members that are gathering over a series of meetings to think about broader um, practical things like um, policies and protocols for students working with this. Um, we're going to be uh, leaning into um, questions that I'm grappling here with, um, with Andrew, such as what is the appropriate curricular design? I would actually say uh, any um, dollop of AI that you're teaching students, I think you need to counterbalance that with the humanities. Um, and uh, I would make a pretty strong argument that the most valuable assets we can give students as they move into a world that is going to be more and more weighted with AI engagement is a great knowledge of humanity and what it means to be human um, rather than just prompt engineering. Uh, and um, I had one more thought on where we we're going with the task group, but it'll come to me later. Um, I do think it's been fun. I know I just sounded very gloomy about it, but it's been fun to have the opportunity to play with this stuff and think deeply about it. Um, and I would say everything I've just said is probably already dated. And tomorrow there's gonna be like six more tools out there that are going to erase all my worries or compound them greatly, probably both. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. I know we are super grateful that you and Andrew have been doing this work and, and helping lead some really important conversations about where we go from here. So thank you. And um, we'll have some time for questions uh, at, at the end, but I want to hear, have you hear from uh, Carmen and Jeff about our other Department X project, and then we'll, we'll do a few questions. So Carmen and Jeff, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um... Thanks for giving us this opportunity to share about our work. I'm going to start us off with a little bit of the context and the origin story. Um, and then uh, Jeff's going to take it from there. Um, so last spring, um, a, ju a junior, a current junior, a rising senior approached uh, me about the idea of having a course offered for the coming year um, that would that would be uh, exploration of Mexico, Mexican culture, Mexican history. His idea was sort of vague, but um, he felt very strongly about it. And uh, I was intrigued and uh, interested. And so um, we, we talked for a little while, the student and I, and as we were talking, um, it came to mind some conversations I had had over the year with Jeff, who was in his first year here. Um, and is a history teacher, I'm a Spanish teacher. And so, um, as we were, as I was sort of talking with the student and uh, talking with Jeff, it sort of started to come into focus that we might be able to build some really interesting curriculum that was interdisciplinary. And, uh, oh, sorry, um, hold on one second. Honey, hold on, I'm in a meeting. Okay, sorry, my four-year-old had a question. Um, so so we just were talking and um, it, it occurred occurred to us that this could be a really great opportunity to apply for a Department X and see if that would give us the space and the time to um, really dig into this and build something interdisciplinary um, that was that was co-created both between the two of us, but also with students involved in the process. Um, the more we spoke and sort of brainstormed, um, we started to center uh, a few different things. We were we were really um, sort of interested in thinking about the ways in which like there's overlap in the in how one might teach the pedagogy of how one might teach history and language, but also the places in which those pedagogies would really um, branch away from each other, and how we could resolve that into an experience for students that would feel coherent, consistent, and that for us would allow each of us to grow towards the other discipline um, while still sort of centering the work that we 
fundamentally want to engage in as educators within our own disciplines. And so, um, so we we developed our proposal and were granted the sort of the fall semester to work on it. And then we launched the class this spring. Um, and so we're midway through teaching it or like two thirds of the way through teaching it right now. Um, and uh, it's been it's 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 been an absolutely phenomenal experience. Um, that I think that's like what I wanted to say about where it started and and sort of what we were talking about um, that got us going. Um, maybe the last piece of it would be that um, I think something else that has that quickly became clear to the two of us um, as we were talking about teaching a class together was how like differently we thought about certain aspects of our teaching and how similarly we thought about other aspects of teaching. Um, and it became very compelling every time we had a conversation about how we could start in really different places of like how to create an assignment or an assessment or um, look at a text uh, and then have that become a new thing that we hadn't tried out before or played with, played with students Played, like played around within a classroom experience with students before. Um, and so that sort of notion of like, really like as Sarah was saying at the beginning, true professional development um, in like real time was one of the the things that we were looking for in this, um, in like making this proposal. Um, and then I'll let Jeff talk a little bit about kind of the experience of building the class and what how it's been going and what else we've been, we've been up to. Sure. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I wanted to mention two things, I think, um, here at the beginning, uh, just that both, both Carmen and I are Mexican, Mexican Americans with deep connections to the country. So it has a, a level of significance to both of us, which is, I think, why this student, a Mexican student himself sort of sought Carmen out in the first place. Um, so that's added a, a layer of significance and maybe engagement and meaning for both of us. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, just speaking for myself, taught for many years at the university level and have co-taught courses before, but at the university level, co-teaching, even interdisciplinarily, I taught one which was with the English department is a literature and history class, and then another one <clears throat> with a political scientist. And both of those devolved, or I don't know, maybe that's too harsh of a phrasing, but both of those devolved into parallel courses where where students would take it for credit for whichever one they wanted, which is true here, but but it would either be you know, one one teacher would do one thing one day and the other would do one thing the next. And and there would be different types of assessments. It really wasn't interdisciplinary. It was parallel. Um, and Carmen and I saw really, really clearly from the beginning that we wanted to avoid that experience completely. What perhaps we didn't see as clearly is the insane amount of touch points that this would require. I'm talking about the architecture of the course, every assessment, how every 70 minute or 40 minute class will go with both of us in the classroom at the same time, um, working in tandem. Uh, so we, we knew we wanted the finished product, which is still in formation, but in terms of how it goes in the classroom, to be some sort of syncretic version that's neither history nor language, but is doing both at the same time. So the class takes place in the Spanish language and what we're doing within the class time is some sort of mixture of what goes on in it. It's, but syncretism really is the word. It's neither history nor, nor language. It's something quite radically different. At least I, I feel that way myself. I think it's also, <clears throat> I think it's engaged a level of vulnerability that I'm not used to accessing myself in terms of exposing like my pedagogical shortcomings or weaknesses or just like half-baked ideas to a colleague whom I really respect um, and who's sort of a um, a master of the craft. And, and then also just sort of knowing how to yield and how to encourage one another and when to do it in which meeting and in which portion of the meeting and in which moment um, all of that has required a lot of work, but it, it's truly thrilling in the classroom to see how something that begins as sort of a wild notion Carmen has that gets filtered through me, and then I voice it in the classroom or vice versa, 
Um, I, and I think when it doesn't seem like a history course to me, and, and I'm not sure how the students are experiencing this, how they're categorizing it, or even how Carmen always is, but when it doesn't seem like a history course to me and it doesn't seem like a language course to Carmen, I think is when we're in really rich terrain. And that's whether we whether we initially had conceived of it that way or not, I think that's what we're striving for is something really, really um, desirable. On a side note, I also want to mention that um, uh, we had the notion of, of creating a, a Mexico trip abroad uh, connected to the course or maybe growing out of the course, I guess I would say, since there, we couldn't really take the 14 kids in the course and make them go to Mexico with us. Um, but we did open it up to the CA school and and the trip took place last month. Um, I have lots to say about that trip, but the, I guess the main thing I want to say in this in this forum is it was just um, unique and stimulating to be in a place that we were teaching about and that neither one of us had been to for a few years, what you know, pre-pandemic and then some. And to be, I think, on an unconscious way, collecting material for the class, whether we realized it or not, I think we were processing it as quickly as we could and we continue to do so today and we did it when we got home, but we've already used in this case, I guess what I'm thinking of is street protest, public art, graffiti, and strike throughs that we saw. We we were fortunate enough to see a, um, the aftermath of a massive protest that took place the exact day we got there, which was the 8th of March for International Women's Day. And a lot of the public art that we and the students came upon the following day, we ended up incorporating into the classroom experiences like a text for the students to analyze both linguistically and with historical themes in mind, um, Mexican women's grievances, fears, et cetera. So um, it really has helped, felt maybe in some cases too experimental at times and maybe, uh, maybe a little too haphazard, but um, I think between the two of us, this culture will have a long life, this, excuse me, this class will have a long life within the CA experience. Um, and I think we'll continue, continue to evolve. Um, that's what I was thinking about for now, but again, during q and be happy to, I don't know, Carmen, if you want to add anything to that right now. No, I just agree a lot with a lot of how you're, how you're describing the class. And I think that for me, um, one of the, one of the other pieces that's been really important is that Jeff and I have both been really open to sort of negotiating the experience in the classroom with the students. And so I think as much as we put an enormous amount of time and effort into planning, we've also tried to be really nimble uh, and react and responsive to the ways in which the students are reacting to material, engaging with material, the direction that, I mean, the fact that we ended up using the the protest art from which I met from the 8th of March, um, I think is a testament to the fact that we were, we were we hadn't, we hadn't planned that because it hadn't happened when we were planning that unit. Um, but we we were sort of with this was sort of the students were with us on this journey and giving us feedback, whether they were aware of it or not, about what was kind of resonating with them, um, the things that they were finding compelling, the questions they were having for us, um, such that it just made sense. Um, like in one meeting, I think Jeff, you like looked at me and you're like, we have to talk about the protest art. And two of the students who are in the class did go on the trip with us and um, had accumulated a lot of of images that they were excited to share as well. So the ways in which there's this element of co-creation from its genesis, um, working with Angelo, who who had this sort of notion of a course that could exist, the the, the student last year, who's also in the class now, and um, and that kind of moving through and continuing as a, a grounding um, component of our pedagogy uh, has been also, I think, really important. And part of, for me, what I, I kind of always want to say I do in my classes, but mm -hmm. don't always have the luxury, I think, of being able to do because I don't have a partner to bounce my ideas off of, um, which I think is the other thing that this, this has provided is that sometimes you like to be by yourself up on the stage with your students, right? And like, you're though, you know, all of it, but um, this, I've actually found it so much more gratifying to have someone else in the class that can like check what I'm saying or add to what I'm saying and it expands it in this new way um, that I've never experienced before and that I think for the students has been really interesting as well uh, 
because they don't often have the opportunity to see two teachers at once kind of figuring out how to explain something, um, hearing what someone else said, having that actually make them think a little bit differently about how, what, how they were going to present the next piece. I mean, the students are right there for it, um, really interested in that dynamic and excited when we kind of get to a sticky place and are trying to figure it out with them. And it's all kind of happening in the moment. Um, like you said, Jeff, it'd be interesting to know how they categorize it or how the, how they're thinking about the course. Um, and I and I hope we get that feedback from them at the end of the year. Um, so yeah, but I think that uh, we might we might be ready to move to questions if if that's the next step. Yeah, that sounds great. And if people want to throw things in the chat, um, I know we'd be happy to to take your questions. I will say it's been a beautiful thing to watch um, from the from the outside this this teaching partnership evolve, and I just I know how much work um, both of you have put in. I don't know if people picked up. I think because um, Carmen and Jeff have both been honoring uh, the the idea that came from a student, really accelerating in some ways our Department X timeline so that they could offer the course while the student was here, and that has meant an awful lot of hard work on their part. So very grateful for that. Is there a um, is there a Department X is there one class and is it each semester or how often does the Department X thing actually happen? Sure, it kind of depends. I guess I I can tackle that one. It kind of depends. So I think right now Carmen and Jeff are just teaching one section of students. Um, sometimes it's been two, uh, and then some years um, the. Department X might be in the researching phase and there isn't actually a course that's being offered, but people are in the planning phase and then it's going to be offered in the next year. So um, it's taken different forms and that's often part of the proposal um, when when individuals or teams submit a proposal of, of how, how would you envision this running? What would it look like? One section, two sections? Are you collaborating in the classroom together? Or, you, you know, so it, it really has varied. And I saw that in the chat, someone asked if we were gonna teach this again. And um, just sort of build off what you're saying, Sarah, I think the answer is Jeff and I both talked about how we would love to see this course run again. Us teaching it together probably won't be able to happen again, um, unfortunately, just logistically, but um, there's definitely been interest from students who are current um, ninth and 10th graders to wonder if this course would happen again before they graduate. So I know that there's like student interest in seeing it iterate in the future. Peggy, it looks like you've got a hand up there. Yeah, sorry, I can't really type. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the class of 73, so all this free form is, is wonderful and a little scary. So I'm wondering how the students react to the um, these courses versus the regular courses, which are more controlled, I would guess, not quite as experimental. So I'm sure there's formal feedback, right, from the students. So has anybody looked at the comparisons to see if the students are more engaged with, with these courses versus the standard courses? Um, well, we did get mid-semester feedback from the students and it was very affirming. Um, I think that they are, they're they're really engaged in the course. I think actually it's mostly seniors. So that's maybe like two thirds seniors and one third ninth, uh, 11th graders. And um, this time of year, sometimes it can be a little tricky to get the seniors to be like 100% engaged. And yes. I actually feel like our seniors are really present for it. And I think it's a testament to the sort of novelty of the experience that it feels fresh and interesting and, and like different enough in a way that um, they're, they're still there for it. Um, not that the other classes are boring, but that they're familiar. And um, I think sometimes there's like something to be said for that, shaking it up that that they're getting a little bit. At the same time, I don't think that we're shaking it up that much. I think that the, the assessment structures we're using are very much within the sort of range of what you would see in, in a more traditional classroom. Um, I think what feels different is 
the the collaborative nature of what Jeff and I are doing and the sort of interdisciplinary components. Um, it's very much like a bilingual experience in that a lot of like the scholarly articles that we read are in English and then we're talking about them in Spanish and the students are having to go back and forth um, kind of constantly in a way that I don't think they're ever challenged to do in any other context. So I think in the sort of intellectual realm, it feels maybe uncomfortable and different, but in the like kind of uh, tangible things that they are asked to do, it's it's probably more familiar. Um, and that's the feedback we've been getting from kids. So yeah, far. and I think it's just that classic teacher masking the vulnerability I'm describing is just, you know, my own Carmen's or the reactions of the students has just been lovely. And I don't know what sort of metric this strikes you as, but within CA, at least for me so far here, this holds a lot of weight. I've heard it mentioned in chapel, I think three times since we started the course as kind of a, a high point. And, and that's enormously gratifying too. I think, I think, I think uh, students are holding the class in high regard exactly why they feel they are rather than what we were attempting to do. You know, that's not exactly as clear to me, but uh, I do feel so far that it's been a great success. Chapel is a, is a, is a great metric. <laughs> um, Leo had a question in the chat about uh, some examples of projects or assignments. And then Elizabeth, I saw your hand and we'll, we'll pop over to you. Well, actually they just did an assessment for us today um, which was a Pecha Kucha style presentation. So those are, um, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but the students had um, 20, no, sorry, 10 slides. We did half of half of one. So they had to do 10 slides, 10 images that they chose, and they had 20 seconds to talk about each image approximately. So it was about a three and a half minute presentation. Um, and they had to do it in Spanish and they had to, um, they had to sort of build a thesis or like an argument that uh, looked at the ways in which power and authority intersected with gender in um, sort of three or four centuries worth of history that we had been discussing. We had looked at um, a number of different figures, the Virgin of Guadalupe, um, an author named Francisca Calderón de la Barca, and an, a poet named Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Um, and then we looked at this protest art from the Women's March. The students had to sort of synthesize all of that content and uh, produce this presentation. Um, so that happened today in class. They were fantastic. It was really fun, um, kind of exhausting to perceive it all. <laughs> um, and then the other assessment that they've done so far was uh, similar in nature. They had to, um, it was, we call it, a, what do we call it, Jeff? A teaching knowledge, content knowledge assessment. Basically, they had to be the teachers. And we, gave, we had a list of terms and concepts. Uh, and then in the moment of the student one on, well, one on two with us, um, we randomly selected, I think, three of the terms and they had to teach, a, teach us about those terms and they had 10 minutes. Um, and so then they, and it was in Spanish. And so um, they were able to prepare the 10 terms but they weren't sure which ones they would be presented with in the moment. And then we sort of had this, we like, you know, blocked out time and the students met with us and they had to like tell us, tell us about it as if we were educated um, but, un, but like didn't know about the topic. Um, and so, yeah, so those are the two assessments we've had so far. We have, not yet planned what the next one will be. Oh, no, we have. We do know what it is. Jeff, We've been thinking about a, a propaganda poster, but we'll see. We'll see. That still needs to brought, be brought to, to full form. Um, yeah. Right. Mexican Revolution era propaganda poster um, is what we're thinking about. And I, I know we're pushing up uh, against our, our time. So, Elizabeth, I think we'll, we'll give you the last question of the evening. And I, I'm just curious whether a literature a literature component is it can be or was incorporated into this. I was a I was an English teacher here in Ontario, and we developed a course years ago that uh, combined the history and literature, and it was very exciting to work with. And I'm just wondering, as somebody who's been struggling to learn Spanish and wanting to read more Spanish, whether this could be incorporated or was incorporated. Yeah, well, so we did, we read we read a number of texts by Sor Juana, um, the Mexican poet um, from the 17th century. And she, so her, her texts were figured, figured prominently in this most recent unit. And um, we haven't looked at like other, other uh, sort of real literary texts 
um, yet. I wish we had that luxury. That takes a lot of time. To, we read Maya. To we read Maya. Oh, yes. and Nahuatl poetry and we did poetry as well toward the beginning of the semester as well. That's right. And we read like proverbs and sort of looked at those as texts. Um, we've kind of played around with the notion of maybe looking at some excerpts from novels in the last unit that we're going to do. Um, there's there's a very well known Mexican novel that we that we might play with in a couple of short stories. So we're we're sort of trying to imagine that, but I think that feels like almost a third discipline to pull yes. in some ways. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Good. Very well, exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. I feel like um, it's been really fun to talk about this. Well, I thought, yes, thanks for all the questions and thank you so much to Justin and Carmen and Jeff, um, both for your Department X work and for sharing it with everyone this evening. And, um, you know, don't hesitate if you're in the area to stop by and, and talk with us some more. And thank you very much for giving us some time this evening. Thank you. All right, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Yes.